Hello, I have my speakers joining me today. Thank you for joining me on this Thursday. Uh, audience, thank you for coming. Uh, I know everyone is pretty busy, so I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, speakers, for joining me today. Audience, I'm going to do a quick icebreaker with my speakers here, but while I'm having a conversation with them, why don't you, audience, go into the chat and let us know where you're calling from? We love to hear from you. And that's another tip. The chat is wide open, audience, so you can go into the chat and tell us everything that you want to know. We will make sure to get into the questions. So let me do an icebreaker with my speakers. Um, what is the best TV show that you watch recently? Uh, mm -hmm. Let me start with Mike. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I watch like a lot of people. We watch The Last of Us, which I thought, oh. I thought was really good. That was really good. Yeah. What was your favorite episode? Oh, um, the one, the second to last episode was very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of action, but we also enjoyed, I think it was the second one where they kind of dove into that world um, with the two characters um, who kind of like set up their own compound. That yeah, that was, was fun. That was yeah. Uh, what about you, James? Um, you know, I've been, uh, I just binged Slow Horses, which is, I don't know if you know Slow Horses, but um very really really good sort of you know espionage drama set in the uk so highly recommended awesome we have jessica joining us from the uk so jessica we All are right, jessica yeah <laughs> uh what about you tukan uh for me i don't watch a lot of tv shows but the recent one that i've watched and loved it is ted lasso oh yeah that was a good I'm a, one i'm a big <laughs> soccer slash football fan so yeah it's, it's a great show Awesome. So uh, let me put my slides up. We are here today to talk about uh, uh, intent data and how to use them with those amazing speakers. This event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. And for those of you in the audience not familiar with Modern Sales Pros, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, uh, revenue operations, uh, marketing, aka our modern sales pros and we help our community with uh, live events like this one you're about to experience we have a robust online forum and we also uh, we're getting back to uh, in-person events which is very very exciting um, and our mission is to create this environment for our community to answer the toughest revenue questions out there. Um, with 35K members, I am pretty sure you will be, uh, no, no questions will be left unanswered and no problems will be left unsolved. So you will be invited to join MSP right after this event if you're already not part of the community. And if you like this content today, you will really enjoy our uh, summits. We have quarterly summits and we have one coming up in April. So you can join in us from April 18 to the 20th. Uh, we have 20, more than 20 events planned. Uh, there will be more than 5,000 people uh, in attendance. Uh, you can hear from 60 plus high caliber speakers like leaders from Sales Loft, Outreach, Gainsight, Stage 2 Capital, and so much more. I am going to drop a link in the chat right now so you can register. But that's enough about other events. Let's talk about this one, how to get the most out of it. So um, this event is being recorded. So all the knowledge that speakers will drop at you today, you'll be able to access uh, at the Modern Sales Pros website later today. And you also will receive a follow-up email with the link straight to the YouTube channel where you can watch it again. Um, and also, as I said before, the chat is wide open. Send the questions to our panelists via the chat or the Q&A function on your right-hand side. Um, and the greatest thing about this event is our partner. We have Sales Intel sponsoring this event today, and we have James in here um, from Sales Intel. Uh, James, can you tell us a little bit about what Sales Intel is? Yeah, I'll get into that in a moment in more detail, but um, we are a B2B uh, go-to-market intelligence provider. We actually leverage account technographic, firmographic, uh, information and human verified uh, contact information to make your go-to-market team orders of magnitude more efficient than they are today. We also heavily leverage and integrate um, intent information, our own news data. We're a partner of Bombora, um, and we've often worked side by side um, with our clients with Foundry's data as well. So um, we're going to talk about this all today, but uh, that's a little bit about Sales Intel. If you're familiar with Zoom Info, then I'm here to share with you that there is an alternative to Zoom Info. We are it. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today, James. And thank you. Absolutely. So we always love being with your community. So I always appreciate the MSP community and, and, and uh, your support, Eduardo. 
Perfect. Uh, community audience, uh, we have a request button with our sponsor at the top of this page. So if you like what James is telling and talking us about today, you can just hit that button and the Sales Intel team will get in touch with you later today. James, I will pass the mic to you. It's your time to shine. Why don't you introduce yourself and ask the panelists to introduce themselves? I will be watching live and taking notes. Uh, but if you need me, just let me know and I'll be back later for the questions. All right. Cool. Thanks, Eduardo. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Again, thanks for joining us. And I'm really, really happy to have Mike and Tukan here who are, I would say the, these guys are like, you know, the, some of the industry's foremost uh, authoritarians here on um, intent and how to use intent and how, how to, you know, surface it and leverage it and build companies around it. I, on the other hand, have been a user of intent for, for multiple, uh, multiple years, including now here at Sales Intel, where we integrate intent. So introducing myself, um, although you already heard from me a little bit, um, I joined Sales Intel back in August. As I mentioned, I've always leveraged intent, um, but by combining that intent information and being able to surface customers, ideal customers that are in market based on using our own technographic and firmographic data, and then having those contacts that are in my target market and showing intent is, um, I, I'm telling you, it's, a, it's, it's right there for any even small mid-sized company to achieve that kind of um, operational outcome and get uh, your team to be far more efficient. So I'll just leave my introduction at that and, and um, move on to my co-host here, who I really appreciate joining, both from a partnership perspective as well as from a thought leadership perspective. Mike, go ahead and share you a little bit about yourself and Bombora. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's good to be here with everybody and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, my name is Mike Burton. I'm a co-founder at Bombora and I run our go-to-market teams. Um, so for those not familiar, Bombora is an intent data company. Uh, our approach to intent data is centered around our data cooperative. So we've built one-to-one -one partnerships with most, uh, quite a few of the largest uh, B2B media businesses in the world. Uh, and other constituents like lead generation companies and events companies. And our goal is to understand how much an individual company normally cares and does research around a specific product or service so that we can you know, confidently um, alert our customers, uh, either direct customers or customers of ours through amazing partnerships that we have. When we see a company that goes into a big statistical spike or what we call a surge in interest on a specific product or solution. Um, so that's a little bit about me and, and kind of Bombora and what we do. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And next, uh, Tukan, we'd love you to say hello, introduce yourself and Foundry. Sure. Hello, everyone. Very nice and uh, excited to be here. So uh, my name is Tukan. I was the former co-founder and CEO of Leadseft, ran that for eight years and then joined Foundry about 14 months ago through the acquisition of our company. Foundry, as uh, we, we were called IDG Communications, we rebranded about a year ago. Foundry is, um, you're probably familiar with all the brands, B2B brands we own, whether it's a CIO.com, CSO, or PC World, Mac World. This is where uh, the iPhone was launched, actually. So um, Foundry is going through a very interesting phase where we are transitioning from just being a media company to being a media, data, and a software company. Uh, that's where um, I am currently as a vice president of product. Uh, we recently launched our first flagship software, self-serve software product called Foundry Intent, where we are basically, you know, as Mike mentioned, we are trying to capture data, trying to predict uh, the likelihood for an organization to be in market. Um, our data is primarily centered around our proprietary data. We call it our first party, meaning second party data that we get from people showing behaviors on our owned and operated properties. We own, we host over a thousand events, we capture that lead generation, telemarketing. We also crawl the open public web uh, and we have partnership with other publishers capturing their data as well. Um, so so that's, that's what Foundry is. And I'm very excited to be talking about not necessarily Foundry, but more around uh, intent data and how it can help. Yeah, excellent, guys. Thanks again. Um, and for everyone listening in, what today was all about was um, giving you a deeper understanding of intent, right? You've got, again, two of the foremost companies in this area, 
We'll, we'll have Mike go deeper on Bombora company surge intent specifically. Um, and I'm sure you're wondering what are the differences between Foundry and, and Bombora. And I would say that the more intent you've got, the better, right? So um, this is what probably the most powerful data asset that I've seen as a marketer um, to make your team more efficient. So you're going to learn about the differences in these two different um, approaches. And, and Foundry intent is another really powerful signal. Um, we'll then look at first party intent and talk about that. It is essentially your own website, right? Resolving visitors to your own website in near real time. There's no better signal. We'll go into news and alerts. And finally, company and contact data chains. Now, these last couple signals, you may think, well, those aren't intent signals. But um, I, would, I love the terminology that Tukan shared where predictive intent. I mean, these news and alerts and changes in a company their technographics or obviously changes in their contact profile, right? Um, are signals, are, are signals that should be used by you, your teams um, the same way you use intent because change when change is happening, um, opportunity is there, right? So we'll go through each of these and then we're gonna land with just an open discussion between the three of us, kind of an organic discussion of how, just giving you guidance on how to get started with all this stuff. Um, and certainly welcome you to throw Q&A questions in, in there, as Eduardo mentioned at the end. We'll cover as many questions as we can. And we plan to leave a good 15, 20 minutes. So hopefully you're all going to be engaged and ask us questions. So I want to hand it to Mike to start off, to go through Bombora intent specifically and give us, you know, a real deep view on where this data comes from, how it gets used. I know, Mike, you're going to go through a case study to show a real world outcome. So I'll let you take it away and just prompt me when you want me to go to the next slide if I'm not um, staying with you intuitively, right? Yeah. No, thanks. I, I, yeah. I think I covered some of this just in the preamble earlier, but effectively the first thing that we set out to do at Bombora was get a proxy for the what we call the B2B internet. So the internet's a big place. Um, at least 95% of it has nothing to do with B2B buying. It's a lot of cat videos and um, stuff about the Kardashians. Um, so we, we, we tried to curate an ecosystem that ignores all of that and focuses only on B2B. So these are things like, you know, niche vertical trade publications, you know, broader business news sites like Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Forbes, like there is business content there that we find valuable. Um, lead generation, um, webinar signups, event signups, things like this, right? So we kind of did the hard work of going out and building a value exchange with the media companies and some other constituents um, that control this content. And so the idea was to have a technology that was able to monitor this ecosystem that we created holistically. So if you think about um, how we do it, um, think about a company um, as kind of like the best I can describe it is a swarm of anonymous bees. So you've got, let's say Boeing, um, we can identify or make a prediction as to anonymous users on the, on this B2B internet ecosystem that, um, all represent employees at Boeing. And if you can identify that kind of swarm of bees, you can watch and see when there's a distinct increase in interest across that cohort of users on a very specific topic or solution. So part of the exercise that we go through with customers is understanding what they're selling, how they're going to market and creating intense signals that align uh, to those to those go to market motions and then monitoring the companies they care about across this ecosystem against those solutions that they're trying to sell. So hopefully that's a that's a good overview. Yeah, and I um, think I get this a lot, by the way, Mike, this I love that we talked about getting this clarification out there, right? There's a lot of confusion on the diff, you know, on basically the two major flavors of, of uh, getting this data and making it actionable, right? And, and frankly, avoiding a lot of false signals, right? Mm. And I think what you guys do at Bombora is really, I think, um, at a premium to some of the other techno techniques you use. So um, I, I'm really happy you're covering this for the audience because for me, yeah. I, I get this question all the time through our partnership. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's funny when you think about other B2B data types that we all use, we all need like technographic data or firmographic data. Um, there's differences, of course, in how that data is collected and then ultimately the output. But there aren't these major disagreements between different methodologies and sources. Right. It might be, 
hey, um, here's a list of companies that we think have, ins have installed Salesforce.com. And here's another vendor's view of that. And it's like 70% overlap. And maybe one has better coverage and one you trust the methodology more, but they're not that different. Whereas a vendor's assertion as to who is in market for a product, in my experience, there's not a lot of overlap. So someone is more likely to be right more often and someone is wrong more often. And that is how you're spending your money and your time if you're using intent data. So the stakes are higher, um, right? It, it's literally how you're spending your money and your time if you're acting off of this data. Um, so it's important to understand the, the different flavors. Um, there's kind of, we look at it and, and to kind of be great to, to get your perspective. We look at it as these three kind of buckets. One is like Foundry or Tech Target or G2 Crowd, where you've got um, owned and operated properties by, a, by usually some type of a publishing business. In the case of G2 Crowd, it'd be a product review site. Um, and that data gets kind of monetized or commercialized as an individual standalone data set. Um, at Bombora, we, we love that data. We know it's really good. Like you should be using it if you have the means or the right platform that brings it in uh, because it's high quality, it's compliant, right? Because that, that Absolutely. publisher, that they have the rights to, to actually mine that data. Um, and, you know, it very powerful. You can see exactly how it aligns to a buying process. Um, not always uh, delivering as much scale as some of the other two categories. We have this co-op approach that I just talked through. And then the third category, which is available natively in, in some of the sales intelligence platforms or ABM platforms out there, is this kind of more mysterious version called Bidstream. Uh, and effectively what happens is across the Internet all day, there's advertising auctions. And metadata kind of flies off of those auctions. And some important data points that come out of that is an IP address and a URL. So with an IP address, a vendor can make a prediction as to what company a user works for. And with the URL, they can know what page that user was on and then go and kind of understand the content of that page. So it's a lot of the same raw materials that we're using across our curated B2B ecosystem. The trouble with Bidstream is it's not a curated B2B ecosystem. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of cat videos and, and the Kardashian news, and they hope to catch some of the rich B2B um, behavioral interactions that are taking place on our co-op and sites like Found and all of the IDG properties that Foundry has access to. Um, so there's a much higher uh, likelihood of false positive because it's drawing from the entire internet. Um, there's a bunch of other, you know, more debatable potentially um, issues around long-term sustainability of this source. Um, like they're not getting permission from the end users and they're not getting permission from the publishers. So those are, those are the two constituents who are creating the data to begin with. That's important. So at some point, if somebody, you know, acts on behalf of one of those two constituents, that the data, you know, uh, could come under fire. Like in EMEA already, IP addresses got pulled out of the bid stream for the most part because of GDPR. Um, so those, that's kind of a high level of the three categories and, and kind of the way we look at the market. Yeah, great. Anything to add? I know, Tukan, we're going to get to Foundry more specifically. Anything you'd add to that? And from your, I mean, you know, for me, I, again, the, the the avoiding those false positives, not to mention the potential compliance, um, you know, risk that kind of lingers, right, in your business to build around something that's fragile, right, Mike and Tukan mm -hmm. seems risky, right? Um, not to mention the false flags, right, the false positives, because you go, you go, you send your team marching down an efficiency, you know, route that isn't actually a good route. Right. So right. Um, I, if I, if I may add two things, yeah. I, I have to clarify is Foundry is uh, very particular about making sure that we don't put our sites, our ad placements on the open exchange specifically for the fear of it being yeah. used in bitstream. That is specifically the reason because it's, yeah. it's not, it's not cool. It's not legal, actually. So that's that's one thing we don't do. Uh, but but one of the things that that we when we at Foundry when we you know, talk to a lot of large enterprise customers, there's a lot of emphasis on the data quality, and 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 they basically the first question that typically happens, and we welcome that, is where are you getting the data from? Without you know hand wavy digital footprint or stuff like that, tell me where are the places. And, 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 and that's something that we are seeing more and more happening, especially in Europe, for sure. And even yeah. all large enterprises, they, that's the first question that comes in. 
And that's why at Foundry, our you know, tagline is real people, real data, real results. So, But it's super important where you're getting the data from. Um, yeah, totally. I think it's definitely, uh, people are getting wise, right? Buyers are getting very wise to it. So Mike, coming back to you, like let's, I love this um, illustration and sort of, you know, tutorial to, to teams on exactly where it fits in and how to leverage it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I think some of it will be good for our uh, discussion later to talk yeah. through. It's, it's a complicated, I'd imagine, you know, empathize with folks. It's complicated. There's lots of use cases. And then you think of that as one vector, all of the different ways and places you could put intent data in from a use case perspective. And then there's lots of different hows. Well, how do I do that? Um, and broadly speaking, we look at the market in two, two big buckets. There's the, the large, I'd say slightly more sophisticated um, enterprise type customers that are want to build all of this on their own. And they build in data, they buy data kind of on a standalone basis, and they build it into a CDP, could be a commercially available CDP or their own data lake. Uh, and they build their own ability to create sophisticated account and contact level segmentation and their own kind of operations for how to pipe that out to field teams. So that's kind of like the, the do it yourself crew. And the bigger part of the market, they're accessing this stuff through platforms. It could be an ABM platform that's allowing, you know, some orchestration across sales and marketing it could be a sales intelligence platform. Um, so I think as as you guys go through the journey, think about what are the use cases that are most important for where you are as a business? Where are you on your journey? Do you need something simple like sales prioritization and nothing else? Or do you need, you know, more flexibility and cross multiple use cases? And then kind of like understanding if you're a do it yourself or if you're looking for the right platforms and tools that are going to bring these data sets together for you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. And then uh, this is a great case study, a, a real world example of um, probably an upper mid market going into enterprise scale company, right? Is, is, I don't know how you characterize Sugar CRM, but. Yeah. And I think they got started, you know, where a lot of we recommend a lot of customers get started and that's outbound sales prioritization. Um, you know, it's this is a use case that once you've done it and it's proved successful, expanding into other use cases kind of organizationally becomes much simpler. Right. Because organizationally, you've already proven that when we call these companies instead of those companies, we get more meetings, we generate more pipeline, we generate more revenue. If you can plant that flag of success, then rallying around that data strategy and infusing that same data strategy into advertising, lead gen, key account intelligence and, and other use cases becomes much simpler. Like there's not a lot of resistance um, to it. So, yeah. you know, this is a good example of, you know, they kind of started with that, you know, really kind of basic but important use case and yeah. saw great success and then were able to grow from there. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can see like 10 weeks, 2 million in pipeline. Right. Um, and that's that's huge. Right. For, you know, they doubled it essentially where they were at. So I've seen that as well, by the way. I've seen our own company do that. Right. In, in deploying the, uh, the data properly. So makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, talk about the buyer's journey and, and sort of we'll finish out kind of your um, kind of the, the, the Bambora angle here and then move to con to you next. But um, share your thoughts on this, Mike. Yeah, I think, you know, everyone has probably heard um, a lot about this over the last several years of this massive change that we're going through in terms of how B2B products are bought and sold. Um, and it's much, much less about long-term sales relationships uh, and playing golf and going out to dinner and much, much more about customers having their own self-led journeys, most of which does not interact with us as sales organizations. Um, so this attempts to um, kind of put some, some color behind that. Um, but it's just this idea that you know, the buyer's journey is happening. Oftentimes we don't know it's happening. Um, but if somewhere in this chart, we can start to interact and give value to the customers that are on these journeys, we're just much, much more likely, um, you know, to be a part of it when it really matters. And they start comparing vendors at, um, and discussing with sales organizations what their needs are and how they're looking at a project. Yeah. And Tukan, I know you must have yeah. data from your world on what the reality of buying is, especially from yeah. an IT an R and D perspective. Uh, perspective, right? So, yeah. yeah, happy happy to talk about this. I, I I love this slide because we use that a lot. This slide in, in Foundry is uh, the stats says 
um, IDG research or foundry research said there is currently there's 20 plus decision makers involved in an enterprise uh, IT purchase. And this is happening in a non-linear fashion over a period of time. A lot of this is anonymous. They're not explicitly coming to you. But let's take a specific example. Um, and we one that we see all day long. So for example, let's say Pfizer as a company, and, and you can pick Barclays or whichever company, doesn't really matter, like an enterprise, they want to buy a new uh, firewall system or something like that. It's a big purchase. Typically the way it would, one of, one of the ways it could work is they might hire a new CIO. The CIO comes in, takes a look at the inventory and goes, you know what? We need to double down on our security. We need to upgrade our firewall. CIO basically gives that charter to her direct reports saying, go do research. They all go on their own. Some are doing Google search, land up on Wall Street Journal doing research. Someone go ahead and post a question on LinkedIn. Someone go to CIO.com, read an article. Um, they start doing. They start reading an analyst paper. They read reviews. They follow someone on social media. They go ahead and attend a physical event, sign up for a webinar. Uh, as they get budget, they start hiring for certain specific roles. Uh, then they might come visit your blog, anonymously don't, not do anything, browse, read an article, bounce back. They do the same thing to your competitors. They might watch a webinar again. They read a case study. And then they make a sales inquiry and then go through the sales process, mm -hmm. uh, making the purchase. Yeah. Just in this contrived example, you start realizing the buyer's journey is extremely complex. It's way more nuanced than someone reading an article on trends in cloud computing on a publishing site. And when we are thinking of it, and that's our philosophical take, we strongly believe in this, um, is when you're thinking of trying to predict buying it, and because it's the goal is the likelihood to buy, you need to look at a holistic view of that. And that's why the stat shows 71% of B2B companies that are over 10 million in revenue in US use three or more sources of data. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the large enterprises use five or more. The reason yeah. being, everyone has a slice of it, not everyone has the full yeah. view of the biogeny. And, and the reality is you cannot have the full biogeny because you don't control the full internet. Um, yeah. So so that's that's the reality. And that's what we yeah. see every day. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that. I think in, in the stat I've seen, like there to, and then too, kind of want to move on to, to, to Foundry, but mm -hmm. like essentially I think what we've seen out there, all of us is 70, 80% of the buying decision is over before your yeah. sales team gets contacted. Yeah. So if you can find that buy, if you can find that buying community at the 20, 30% mark right. through Foundry data, through uh, Bombora data, right? And like you said, Tukan, multiple sources, like why not give yourself every advantage to intercept that buying cycle with thoughtful communication at the 20% mark, as opposed to at the end when you may or may not be in, in, in contention, right? So absolutely, I think it's yeah. a great, great way to think of it. So um, cool. Yeah. So, so go, go ahead uh, to kind of talk a little bit deeper about Foundry yeah. now, second signal. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so one of the things about Foundry is our data, our intent data story is the depth and, and, and the richness of the data because we are a publisher ourselves. We have our owned and operated properties. We have our exclusive proprietary audience that are coming in doing research, downloading content, talking to us, attending our events, um, you know, having telephone conversations, all kinds of things, subscribing to our newsletters. We are getting a ton of rich information about people. And a significant fraction of the information is at the level of a contact. And that's a, that's a key differentiator for us. And if you think of from activating intent or actioning intent, that is the missing piece. Is It's great, you told me this company is showing intent, but going back to the example of Pfizer, Pfizer has 1,100 IT people in their organization. If I told you Pfizer has a score of 98 on firewall, your sales team still has to figure out who they will be talking to, to the SDR use case or something like that. One of the things that we do is we actually tell you, oh, by the way, out of the eight signals you saw in Pfizer, eight of them were from actually their Virginia office and two of them were from Jenny Smith, the director of IT. And by the way, these are other members of the decision-making group. We have information on because we have seen other people engage with content relevant. Um, so we we have, I, the stat says 57 data points. For some of them, we have over 100 data points on an individual user of all the different things. At the board at a company and at a contact level, 
And we get the data both from capturing you know, information that's happening on foundries and properties. Um, we also addressed, we foundry also realized to Mike's point, there's a problem of scale. Because if you're only looking at your own property, it's rich data, but you don't have the depth of what's happening. And that's the reason you know, Foundry ended up buying LeadSift and Kickfire to get that scale, to get what's happening everywhere else. And we also have partnerships trying to capture that. Um, so that's why we have a ton of rich data. That's not just content consumption. We look at technographics. We look at hiring trends. We look at tech spend data. We look at contract renewal data. We look at are they attending events? Did they have new, you know, did they mention anything SEC filing or press release? We capture all of that and combine this. The beauty, and I think we'll talk about this, that, that found and why we are excited about the whole space is, um, is as we try to capture our own data and partner with companies, you know, Bombora and or others, like and there is a partnership with Bombora, one of our sister companies and ABM, Triblio. So as we try to do this, Foundry has the capability then to activate the data. So being a media company, literally you take the data, you click a link, you can run a highly targeted display campaign, or you can do a lead gen campaign. Um, so that's that's the other piece I think of intent that is very important. Mm-hmm. I think Mike touched on it and you is I can give you the best data possible, but if you don't have a streamlined, clear way of activating it, different on channels, marketing, like top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, or sales, which sales intel does, it's it's not gonna be useful. So that workflow, streamlined workflow of the data to activation and then full funnel reporting is key. Um, yeah, we'll talk so about yeah. that at the end. And, and you're right, like the ability to activate because you have the <clears throat> publisher relationship with these individuals, you can leverage that. That activation is really powerful. And then, yeah. you know, I, I love the fact that one of the reasons we are so aggressively integrating intent data as sales intel is because we can activate in a similar fashion, right, to complement that, right, because we have the contact data. So that's a great way to think of it. Um, yeah, and I think this is a great... Um, Great case study and it more on the marketing angle, right? So I think Mike, you did a really good job of sort of articulating a, a sales efficiency play, right? When you talked about sugar, but talk about treasure data here uh, yeah. to come. Yeah, yeah. So and funny enough, treasure data was also using other different intent sources. Remember I said they use three or more on average. Yeah, they were having a bunch of different sources. And one of the things they were doing is we were piping the data into their marketing automation system at a contact level, they were taking these contacts, they were nurturing them through digital channels. And then after they reached a certain score, they would give it to the sales team to say, hey, these are the contacts at these accounts you should be talking to. Because we saw them showing signal, these people, um, and now we have qualified them, now you go talk to them. They ended up seeing 35% of the of the contact move into MQL. This is better than any other lead by or other things, other channels that they have done. So that's, yeah. that's a very... Uh, well-established process. And the key here was the integration, was piping the data directly into their marketing automation and then activating, yeah. qualifying it, and then giving it to sales. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that later yeah. too, because that, that, that comes up in the example I'll give is yeah. the, the added power of intent data to your, essentially your scoring engine, right? You're no longer just in this antique world of marketing activity, but you're waiting for people to engage with your content. That's really hard these days, right? But intent as a signal, um, again, it comes earlier and it's yeah. actually more powerful. Yeah. So cool. Um, well, that's great. So um, anything else? Sorry, uh, anything you would close on there, Tukan? Or, or no? Uh, one, yeah. I, I I see the comment, and there's a comment around. It's it's very relevant on first party intent. I absolutely think the strongest form of signal is someone coming to your website and doing some behavior. Uh, one of the things that we do at Foundry and, and not to take this shine of what you're we're saying is we, because of Kickfire, we merge that first party stuff. So it becomes super actionable saying, hey, we saw them doing all these things in second and third party. And by the way, they were also checking out your pricing page. Merging that, changing the score yeah. is, is super, that is the key. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you've got someone and, and uh, I mean, that's the ultimate signal. I mean, look, in fr- so first party intent, right? A lot of p- folks are familiar with it, but this is obviously the ultimate form of intent. I think the limitation here, to be honest, right? This in isolation, a lot of people start here and they're like, oh, I'll just, I'll just get first party intent. It look by that time, <laughs> they're really late in the process probably, right? So it's a super powerful signal. We love it, right? We use it ourselves, right? Every marketing team uses it, but 
you know, be, be aware that it's really most powerful when complemented when with a more scaled signals like you get from Bombora and Foundry, because you're going to be able to, you're going to able to see that intent earlier in the prying process. And then you hopefully are, are influencing them to actually come to the website. Then you see them hit the website and then you, you know, now, you know, right. You're building that momentum. Yeah with that particular buyer. So it's a very powerful signal, but be aware it's going to be lower scope. There's going to be less scale to it, right? And it's a signal that when layered on top of the, the broader, more scalable, more early market signals, like you're getting from Bumbora and, and Foundry, that's the way to use it. This is really easy to use. I mean, you know, it, essentially it's, you know, it's a snippet of code. Um, you know, here at Sales Intel, we provide it as part of what we do, obviously, in combination with intent data. Um, and when we uh, see those anonymous visitors, we're able to resolve them, resolve them into the company and the people behind that, that anonymous visitation. And this is first party. You're well within your, you know, your rights to understand, know who's visiting your own website, right? Um, and so that gets resolved and you can take action accordingly. So it's one of the more powerful capabilities out there Again, in combination with when you see, you know, to me, it's like a concentric circle. We'll get into this a little more later, but you've got, first of all, you got your ideal customer, right? You define, you should be defining, everyone in the B2B world today should be defining where is, where is my ideal customer market, right? What are the, in our case, just giving sales until example, I know there are 26,324 companies that are where I'm three times more likely to win, where my ACVs and retentions and expansions and my lifetime value is three times higher, right? If my team and my marketing effort is on that lens, I'm right away, I'm six times more efficient than if I'm not. Now I layer on intent. And not only do I have the ability to, to, to be focusing in on my ideal market, now I'm focusing in on who's actually in market, right? And to con to your point, you send that signal to your sales team. You send that signal to your content syndication uh, play. And then finally, first party intent data, right? So um, it's a real powerful combination. That's why in this conversation, we sort of layered it third. But you know, the way it's done is you're, you're doing, you're using reverse IP lookup, you know, you're using um, matching anonymous visitors to your ICP. Um, and there's also the ability to do what we call human verification, right, in our case. So if you see or get resolution that a certain company is visiting the website, you may or may not have all the, the contacts you need in your CRM. You may or may not have them even from us, right? Just like Mike and, and Tukon are explaining, like no single intent provider has the entire internet covered. No single B2B intelligence provider has every contact in the world. Like I'm telling you right now, we don't. We have a massive amount, but when we are missing someone you need, especially if you see an intent and a, and a first party intent signal, we've got the research on demand capability to go find them for you, right? So instead of your team doing a bunch of account research, right, we're doing it for you and we're arming you with the ability to, to take advantage of the knowledge of who's visiting your website, who's showing intent. Um, so really at the, the right side, it's, it's ABX fuel, right? It's the critical, and this is really, I think, um, you know, the sugar CRM story, right? It's, it, it's, it's the key information to understand who is in market, right? Um, on the treasure data side, it's actually leveraging that to arm your, your, your marketing strategy, your syndication, right? It's a lead scoring that's come up. And so all of these things are impacted by this stuff. Um, so in the, in the interest of, of, of time, because I want to have a, a, ni a nice amount of time for Q&A, these last two signals, people may say, well, these aren't really intent. But again, as I let off the, the discussion, um, when you operationalize how you use intent, there's a lot of other um, signals that, that get operationalized within your, within your team the same way and can have a lot of impact. One is absolutely news and alerts. Um, so we have actually at Sales Intel, you've been noticing we've been building out and getting far more robust in our contact database, in our technographics and infirmographics data. And now um, I'm sharing with you, even ahead of our press release, that we have our own um, you know, news and alerts capability now being launched in April and it's in beta with customers. Why is news and alerts so valuable, right? Um, it is a... Um, it basically is 
going to give you information um, about new funding, executive hires, right? You're going to see strategy updates to the company, right? A press release, um, a product news, an expansion, M&A, right? Um, there's, there's tons of signals out there. And those alerts or signals are, are signals of change, strategy change, leadership change, um, you know, a champion that is a current customer now going to another company, right? A job changer. Or conversely, a champion um, at one company going, you know, uh, you know, exactly coming into your to your ICP that wasn't there before. So these signals are really powerful, along with intent, and and your the way you act on them is similar to intent, right? When change is occurring, it often brings opportunity. Now, the source of news data and alerts, just so you know, is. In our case, right, it's 39 categories. We've got seven major categories and 32 subcategories. At a macro level, there's positive and negative. In a micro level, these are just examples, right? We might know about bankruptcy, <laughs> patents being filed, funding announcements, et cetera. Um, and the key is to have the ability for the alert, for the alerts to be issued off this data, right? You don't want to have to actively search it on your own. What you want to be doing is tracking specific companies, maybe specific signals, just like you do intent, right? And when those signals fire, right, they're going to come right into, you know, right into the salesperson or marketing team's world. Hey, here's a group of people or companies with a change signal based on news that matters, right, that we should act on. So it's a really, really powerful signal um, to be paying attention to, and it's not hard to integrate, right? It's built in sales, Intel's case, it's built right into what we do every day. Um, and then I mentioned that, you know, um, predictive intent is the term that I think Tukan's using. And I love that in your own CRM, right, or in your B2B intelligence provider like, like Sales Intel, you should be um, proactively monitoring job changers, right? Looking for people who you notice are no longer at, you know, an important customer you've got. Or if there's um, a certain group of, co of contacts that you've been trying to, to work with from a from an outbound perspective, and you see those contexts change, or you see new new contexts coming in into that lens of ICP and intent, where you're going to be efficient as a go-to-market team, that all should be operationalized and acted on. Um, so this is another form that that um, you can use, right? So think about an example of technographics, right? I care, we care when we see a a smaller team upgrade to a new marketing automation platform that we integrate with, whether it's HubSpot or Marketo, that is a great signal for us. We're, we're getting a sense that their marketing capabilities are moving, they're up leveling, they're becoming more sophisticated, right? And we are really good fit for a company that's moving into growth stage, right? Um, that signal is power, powerful to us. So I just simply monitor using my own data. When I see a new group of companies suddenly adopting a marketing automation layer, now I can fire off an, an entire campaign against that because it's, again, it's a moment of change. And I know our data integrated into that marketing automation platform is going to make them more powerful. So those are just a bunch of other examples of signals. Um, and I think with 16 minutes to go, guys, I think let's, let's round it out here with a panel discussion. I think, you know, I'll start it off with questions to, um, I guess, Mike, we'll start with you. And then Tukan, I want you to comment on the same way, but like, a lot of questions, a lot of people think intent is really complicated, hard to integrate, hard to operationalize. Like we talked about a lot, right? We got pretty deep in the weeds, but let's bring it back down to earth and be like, how do you get started? Like, yeah. Mike, how do you get started? Maybe different flavors depending on the company size you are. But why don't you take a shot at that? And then Tukan will have you build on that. Yeah, I think I mentioned before these kind of two vectors. One would be use case and the other would be how. And so look at kind of where you are from a maturity perspective and think about the use cases that make sense. So if you have a big demand gen budget and that's that machine's kind of running, then putting intent data into that part of your marketing funnel um, might be a great place to start. Yeah. If you're earlier on and maybe you have a small SDR team, um, but you don't have a big marketing budget, then outbound SDR could be a good place to start. So like, think about the use case. If you're a massive enterprise and you're kind of doing everything um, from a use case perspective, but 
you, you just haven't put intent into any of it, then that's that's good news. You have a lot of different use cases that you can systematically move through, but still prioritize and think about where you're going to get, you know, kind of like the low hanging fruit from a results and a ease of implementation perspective. Yeah. Um, one of the good questions in the in the chat was like, OK, let's say the answer is outbound sales. And, and it often is like 50 percent of the time it is. Um, if that's the answer, then how do we get them to do it? And what we advise is to start small. Find a group of sellers or a group of SDRs, a team that works in a certain region, uh, even just two or three people that lean into things and are progressive as opposed to resistant and prove out the concept um, with a small group of people, less through the lens of like, hey, is this thing going to work? More through the lens of let's work out the kinks of this thing. That's just clearly a better way to do it. Uh, whether that's, you you know, obviously if you're using multiple forms of intent data and the data that's coming from your website, you're going to have better results calling on those companies than calling on random companies, you know, based on firmographic data. Yeah. Uh, so I guess from a sales perspective, my advice is, is start small. Yeah. Yeah. Tukan, how would you advise people to get started? Yeah, if, if I may add one thing to what Mike said. From yeah. an SDR outbound perspective, it is a very common use case. At least in Leadsip, we saw that definitely more than 50%. And that's the easiest way to get started. But one thing to keep in mind is expectation setting. One thing that we heard a lot of the times um, uh, is, you know, when they think of intent, they're like, okay, so these guys are going to buy my product. So in, in the example that I gave people were, let's say previously, if you had 100 if you're reaching out to 100 contacts just based on firmographic data and you book five meetings, for example, right? 5% with intent, if your expectation is you're going to book 50 meetings, you're going to be disappointed. It might happen, but it's an outlier. That yeah. doesn't happen. So what we say is, well, two things. One with intent is you're saving the time in figuring out which accounts to go after. That's a big value add, time saving. But then when you do reach out, the number would be if you're getting five, you might get between eight to 10 meetings. So it's a 50 to 100 percent, not a 500 percent increase. So that's one thing. The other thing is, once you do get those eight meetings booked in your SDR outreach, the, the chances of them moving further down the funnel faster is greater. So that's yeah. one expectation setting that we talk about. Yeah. And Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. No, yeah. this is great. Thank you yeah. for adding that. Like, and there's a couple other things. One is the deal sizes are bigger. Right. These are these, are these are projects. These are projects yep. that have already been prioritized. They're already being yep. researched. These are the deals yep. you want to be in. These aren't like one person who kind of gets enchanted by your sales pitch, who you've got to like push a boulder up a hill. Like these are good deals. That, yeah. that's and there's churn risk to those too, right? I'm, I'm sure the LTV is higher, right? Because you've got a serious yeah. effort, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, and to Tukon's point about the, you know, going from five to eight to 10 is remember, we are interrupting their self-directed journey. We're, we're right. saying right. we want to be a part of this. We think we can add value. So right. to think that it'll be 50 is to right. ignore the fact that they're on their own journey. So most right. of those people are like, I'm not ready to talk to sales right. yet. Like that's right. still true. We can't change that. Right. But we can, by, by fishing in that pond, we're increasing the chances that we're going to to catch a fish or get some engagement. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I, I think, think that's, yeah, that's uh, the, the, um, the other, the other two components I build on um, and in this, so it's, it's uh, if you have some layer of marketing automation, uh, this came up earlier, um, a great, great way to get your sales team and your marketing marketing team sort of aligned on this is to add to your, to your MQL scoring process, which I think you talked about for treasure data, right? This is the example add intent signals to that scoring. At Sales Intel, I have a um, technographic, firmographic signal. Is this account a good fit for my product, right? Don't ever lose sight of that, right? Because just because you've got an intent signal, that intent signal may from a, be from a company where you have no chance to win, right? If I've got an intent signal that I'm seeing from, I don't know, a company in Latin America, well, guess what? I don't have data in Latin America. <laughs> So, you know, so you still have to combine the intent signal with where it is that you win in market, your ICP. That can help with that five to eight equation. So you might only get three or four or five more meetings, but you're going to get them in an ideal part of the market. That is huge efficiency, right? right. Number two, you're going to win more often, right? And number three, and I love this part of it, is you start to align sales and marketing, right? You're all starting to sing 
from the same songbook, right? And that can become very painful. So going through that marketing automation layer, if you've got it, and feeding your BDRs and sales team those accounts, and then you, in, in the case of Sales Intel, since we're a sponsor, like using our research on demand team to fill out the buying centers, right? Rather than doing account research that crushes your team's productivity, um, that is really simple and can be done literally in a month of, of, yeah. of relatively easy effort. So go ahead, guys. What else would you add there? One thing that I would add is we, we sort of started from the bottom up. So we started yeah. talking from SDR to middle of the funnel. The other yeah. use case, that the other very common use case is more on the top of the funnel side. Yeah. So you take those accounts that are showing intent, whether in your first party and contacts you build, depending on the data you have, you might build an account-based audience or a contact-based audience and then run highly targeted ads based on intent. Yeah. You change the bid strategy based on what the uh, in accounts are showing intent. So you run highly targeted ads to a set of group of, group mm -hmm. of people trying to get them to your website, convert. And the other thing that you do is you take the data, you run uh, lead generation programs, content syndication, stuff like that. You're yeah. doing a webinar. Why don't you figure out people that are researching on intent and target them with this, right? We see this all day long. So that's that more of the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel is the marketing nurture and then sales, uh, SDR activity. Uh, that's the, the, Those are the three things. The yeah. other thing that I would say is not all intent signals are created equal. So for yeah. example, first party intent signal is the strongest. I, I think there is no agreement, disagreement on that. If someone's coming to your website, um, but the reality is, and I think someone had asked this question, 97% of the people that come to your website don't, don't fill out the form. So majority of them are anonymous. That's why you need tools like, as you mentioned, James, the tool Visitor Intel or Kickfire or Clearbit or something that will tell you who these people are, or not these people, who these companies are at a, at a certain percent. Then one tactic you do is you take those accounts and then you can run two things. You can do a target ad campaigns towards those accounts, uh, you know, knowing that these are the accounts that are visiting. I want to target the decision-making group within that account. Or you can give those accounts to the BDR team then say, okay, I know these companies are visiting my website. They haven't filled out a form, but I know their research group is these seven people. Let me hit them up with a targeted email campaign. So that's how I would, I would do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think, um, well, I'll close on this and we'll hand it over to Eduardo and to, to, to come back on and do any Q and a, um, any more Q and a, but, um, the one single piece of advice I'll leave everyone's call with is when you, when you, and it goes to the expectation setting for your team, um, people, companies get enamored with intent for good reason. It's the most powerful B2B intelligence signal that exists, right? However, if you ignore the other parts of your business, like I described earlier, if you, if you simply just start doing everything in your marketing layer, in your outbound efforts based on intent, and you don't um, limit the intent signals to where you know your target market lives, you will waste money and you won't see the results you want. So think of it as like a, a, a you know, um, I guess think of it as a concentric circles, like I said, when you're, when you've got that, that wider lens of your ideal customer, and then within that lens, you layer on intent. In our case, it sells Intel. I mentioned 26,324 companies are in my ideal customer profile. I know from Bombora data, from um, all the signals I've got that about three to 5,000 are in market at any one time. Now, to con to your point, I'm directing my syndication strategy, right? Through Foundry, right? And I'm directing my paid strategy, uh, even through the native platforms to those companies showing signals. Now, everything gets more efficient, right? But don't, don't make the mistake of ignoring all the other work you've done in your, your go-to-market strategy and throwing it all out and just leveraging intent. It's really that layer to make you hyper-efficient, right? Win rates, better quality meetings. So cool. Um, this was an awesome, fun, guys. I love talking to you, the two of you on these calls. Um, Eduardo, uh, you can rejoin us if you want and, and finish up here. We got six minutes, I guess. But Awesome. Do you think we have time for one more question? Sure. Yeah. Let me pick a good one. We got six minutes, five minutes. Yeah, we have some time for some questions. Let me see this one. Uh, Michael is asking, can intake, intent also be used to disqualify an app faster for the year, especially for annual purchases? Then your team can focus on closing other accounts and you can put those into nurture. Yeah. Uh, who wants to start? Mike, all I right. Could, yeah, I could take a crack at it. There is this kind of... Um... You know, we at Bumbora, we have this use case framework that we've created to uh, help our customers through the journey. And there's one that hasn't quite cracked it yet. 
bleeding edge and this idea of pipeline analysis. And there's companies like EBSTA mm -hmm. um, and Insight Squared, and they're, they're starting to look at these use cases as well, where I just want to analyze my pipeline and I want to look at historical behavioral activity from my website and from third-party intent data provider like Bombora or others and analyze what uh, if the journey of the companies in my pipeline is consistent with close one deals so that I can start to rank and prioritize what's already in pipeline, right? So it's this kind of um, uh, unicorn and, and rainbows world where a rep, actually their input is secondary to does this look like a deal behaviorally that closes so that we can start to do kind of like stage analysis and, and deal moving through the lens of behavior as opposed to just kind of, you know, sales rep intuition. So I'd say it's early days for that, but one day we, we will, we will analyze the uh, B2B pipeline based on this data and other data inputs and, and just kind of behavioral matching against close one. Yeah, I would uh, add plus one to that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think space, it just does it. Yeah. And, and a simple right. form of that today is honestly going back to what I described. You, you should be you've got marketing activity. You've got intent. You've got your ICP definition. Um, I think that those signals in combination can give you a really simple way to prioritize. Right. Um, so it's a it's a rudiment. It's a it's a rudimentary version, Mike, of what you describe. But it yeah. actually I mean, it works really, really well. I think people are forgetting like you're no longer beholden to just the the you know decades old marketing activity score for your MQL, right? You've got a lot of other data to use that can be a, a good indication of is this a deal that's going to close or do, do I just nurture it and and because I my my sales team's time is so valuable. Hmm. Cool. Uh, we have time for one more. Let me see. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeanette uh, is asking, how do you actually get the sales team to actually use this data for prospecting and outbound, especially a smaller team where there aren't any SDRs? That's a yeah. tough question. Let me hear from Tukan. Do you have anything to say to Janita? <laughs> um, so that's the thing, right? How do you do prospecting when you do not have SDRs? Um, and, and James might be a better, like sales intel might have an interesting use case. The one that I think of a low hanging fruit that we actually used at Leadset because we didn't actually have an SDR for the longest time. We were actually taking those lists and uploading a list of accounts and contacts that are showing intent. And we were running paid social and actually Google ads. So we upload that list of people and companies, build a custom audience on Facebook, LinkedIn, and, and, and Google, and run targeted ads. That's scalable. It doesn't need SDRs. The goal is to and and all of those ads was not were not awareness ads were basically book a meeting because we were trying to replace replace the SDR. So that's one way we have done it, um, very successfully, very high um, uh, conversion rate, high click through, lower uh, CPC. But that's one way I, I I we have done it ourselves yeah, without I'd, an SDR. I'd add I'd ask if if the AE. Um, mm. So there's no SDR. Are these AEs doing outbound today? Right. If yes, good. Then work with the progressive ones that are open to this and do a small yeah. test and prove that it worked. If yeah. they're not doing outbound today, don't do it. Yeah. Because we don't want to be in the behavior changing business. We want to be in the account changing business. Right. We want to just put these accounts, these better accounts into the workflow that already exists. Yeah. And so if these AEs aren't doing outbound, trying to get them to do outbound is a boulder that you don't want to push up a hill. And I defer to Tukan's idea. Find a different way to surface uh, contacts or hand raisers from those accounts um, and feed them those instead. Yeah, I think you're in an incredibly luxurious position if you don't have to outbound. So I think the majority of the time I would to close on this, like, look, I think um, in, in our case, you know, feeding those AEs, um, the signal you're seeing, the contacts and accounts that are showing that signal, and then a simple play. But give them some content, and I think find those progressive AEs. Like, if I'm an AE, I don't know why I wouldn't accept that. It would be, you know, um, shocking to me, right? You don't have to, you have to consider that particular uh, resource, <laughs> perhaps up leveling, right? Um, because it's so, it's such a powerful signal. And then again, if you provide them what the signal is, and then we we build plays around this certain signal, right? 
there are certain signals that are so important to us that we have plays built around it to help the outbound motion, to help them with content. If you've got a marketing team to do that, or even if you don't, like work on it as a group, get your progressive AEs to think it through. So, um, all right. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for answering. We are running out of time. It's time to wrap things up. Uh, Tukan, Mike, and James, as always, you are fabulous, fantastic, great knowledge here. Audience, thank you for joining us today. You are the best part of MSP. Wait for an email from me later today. You're going to have the um, link for the recording, the key takeaways from our uh, speakers, and uh, a few other resources that sales and help together yeah, for and us. Then, if you liked... I, I forgot to mention, we, for anyone who listened or heard, we're happy to do a free trial for anyone to call uh, with five and 10 signals. So if you want to take me up on that, just hit the request a demo. We, we, wanna, we always try to give some sort of uh, benefit to the MSP community through an offer like that. So um, Right here. So we have yeah. this offer. Sorry, I, missed um, that. I will add this offer. <laughs> no worries. I will add this offer to my follow-up email audience. So if you... If you want to hear from the uh, Sales Intel team faster, just click the Request a Demo button at the top of this page, and I will include this uh, offer to my follow-up email. But thank you for joining us. James, Mike, uh, Tukan, uh, amazing content. Uh, audience, I will see you later. Uh, we have much more events coming up. Um, while the speakers are now hang out, while the speakers and I, sorry, hang out backstage, we'll make sure that you will receive the uh, recording and the key takeaways on your email audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, speakers, we can go uh, backstage. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you.